The dominant narrative of the modern NBA is the idea of small ball. You guys have all heard it before. Pace and space, three and D, stretch four, stretch five, switchability, rim runners, rim protectors. It's how we talk about the construction of teams and it's how we evaluate young players and their ability to survive in the modern NBA. But how did we get here? What caused this change? Is the NBA really smaller? Has basketball suffered? What did Bill Murray whisper to Scarlett Johansson at the end of Lost in Translation? Why didn't Lost ever explain Walt's powers? Let's figure it out. Before legal defense was eliminated, two seismic events pushed basketball to become what it is today. The implementation of the shot clock, which established minimum pace, and the three-point line, which created space, and the opportunity, obviously, to score more points on one shot. The trajectory of hoops is spelled out right there in two rule changes. The 24-second shot clock was adopted in 1954 largely to increase the speed of the game, obviously, and it did. More possessions equals more opportunities for stars to shine, and star shining means the expansion of the product. But it was also because teams at a disadvantage, which at the time meant teams that didn't have George Mikan, were attempting to slow the game down to a halt by holding the ball. Basically, teams were saying, we can't beat you at basketball, so we are going to employ the strategy of not playing basketball. It's brilliant. It's like trying to win an argument by not participating. But I can't see. The attempts to negate the power of the dominant big man were thwarted, though, and these smaller teams were once again forced to deal with these behemoths. But then it happened. The three-point line came to the ever-experimenting ABA in 1967, where it was pushed by George Mikan, of all people. Ten years later, the three would come to the NBA for the first time in 1979-80, the same year that saw two transcendent figures enter the league. Pace and space were officially in place. Nice one, Kyle. Radical ideas typically live to the left of every part of culture. On the whole, people are pretty stubborn about change until they see that it either benefits them or they're fatigued and worn down by the idea or they just never adjust. Some people just never adjust. You see it in music all the time. Hip hop artists, bands, producers, wild imaginative ideas are often slow to catch on, scoffed at, enjoyed by a niche few early on. Sometimes the pioneers get forgotten once their ideas have fully crystallized. They're borrowed from copied, and then someone comes along and melds all the innovation in one fully realized bit of genius. The ideas slowly catch on and then the novel becomes the norm. In some ways, the institution of the three-point line and the shot clock were like the invention of the 808 or the first sampling machines. It gave everyone the opportunity to create, and not just the big guys. The three was not widely embraced strategically in the 80s and 90s. Take into account the fact that this was thrust on a generation of players that had grown up not accustomed to shooting from that distance. It took until 1995 for the league-wide three-point percentage to break 35%, and for the first five years that the line was in place, the percentages hovered in the 20s. People thought that it was a waste of time to focus on the three because not everybody could hit it consistently. In 1989, Don Nelson, a guy that we've talked about on this channel before, this isn't a channel dedicated to Don Nelson, but it could be if you guys want to. Don's legendary run TMC Warriors teams were more of an experimentation in philosophy of lineups. They led the league in pace of play and were in the top five and attempted and made threes per game. Nelson always says that he chose that style of play to get his best players on the floor, and he had great players, Tim Hardaway, Chris Mullen, Mitch Richmond. If you think about it, the idea of getting your best players on the floor seems so glaringly obvious that it's a wonder it was ever ignored. If Don had had strengths at the natural positions, who knows if he would have even tried that strategy, but necessity bred innovation. And if convention calls for you to be at a disadvantage, you obviously buck convention and get creative. That's exactly what Rick Pitino did at Providence in the late 80s. I know, I know, it's uncool to give Rick Pitino credit these days. <laughs> he's become a whipping boy in the basketball world, and you could argue that he's kind of helped that become a reality himself with some of the things he's done. But eventually, I hope that he gets his due as an innovator because he is. Even though he'd go on to have extremely talented teams, that 1987 Providence team and his early Kentucky teams relied heavily on the three-point shot and full-court pressure defense to hide weaknesses and exploit a simple universal truth that was always looking us right in the eyes. This is from Stu Jackson, a former Rick Pitino assistant at Providence. I remember to this day 
he sat down on a magnetic board and, you know, with a, a pen and showed us the math. And he said, listen, you know, with this team, if we take X amount of three-point shots, and shoot 33%, it's better than taking X amount of shots and shooting 40%. And we're all sort of scratching our heads, but he was right. But when we came down offensively, we played basketball inside and out, but we were looking for the three-point shot, and we took an abundance of them and made it abundance of them. Since 1970, the number of players drafted in the first round who are 6'10 or taller has gradually increased, actually. In the late 90s and in the early 2000s, it actually spiked, which can likely be attributed to one person. In a lot of ways, the isolation era overstayed its welcome by about 10 years. It's a big reason why Mike D'Antoni's son's teams made such a splash, that and they had Steve Nash. The post-Jordan era saw a league full of underprepared players, a result of the high schooler boom that spurred Kobe, LeBron, Garnett, and McGrady people trying to copy that, and a glut of huge players who were underskilled and who were added to a pile of guys intended to battle Shaq and Tim Duncan. Assist rates were also at an all-time low during this time. Really, small ball is more of a convenient tagline than reality. For a few highly unique teams, sure, but league-wide, skill ball is a lot more like it. The goal isn't to get smaller players on the court, it's to get more skilled and versatile players on the court. Because the more the space of the floor is embraced, the more pivotal versatility becomes comes. Each of the last nine NBA seasons ranks in the top 15 of lowest turnover seasons league-wide. That's skill. This decade also has given us nine of the top 10 lowest totals in personal fouls, which obviously has a lot to do with the way the game is officiated now, which helps. Still, the all-time records for players 6'10 or taller being drafted in the first round was broken in 2016, two years ago, and nearly broken again in 2017. And the league average for height has been 6'7 since 1983. The league is not necessarily smaller. It's more skilled. Big players aren't necessarily going away. Slow and unskilled players that lack versatility, they are going away. I think that generational circumstances matter when you're projecting the future of basketball. Like we said, kids in the 70s didn't grow up shooting threes, so the three was wildly inefficient there. And in the 80s and 90s, guys over 6'10 were likely greeted with a firm get your ass on the block every time that they stepped away, and spending less time developing ball skills or a face-up game. Also, and this is just my theory, skills development is more widely discussed and publicly assimilated than ever before, and we're seeing the results. Drew Hanlon is super famous now. When has that happened before? Even high schoolers don't just go play pickup or work on their driveway with a shovel in the off season anymore. They train incessantly and with highly focused goals that are driven by data. The league will get faster and faster and players will get more and more skilled. Stylistically, there's not a clear answer as to how you can zig in a world where the Warriors are zagging so far from the pack that they can't be overcome, especially when they've got five all NBA caliber players on the roster. Imitation is likely not the answer because you can't imitate having arguably two of the best shooters of all time and one of the best isolation scorers of all time. This iteration of the NBA just might not be equipped to do that during their reign. Those early Rick Pitino teams and Don Nelson teams were biting at the status quo. Even if they found some success, they weren't the best teams, so they were likely considered an anomaly or a novelty. It's a copycat league, you've heard it a hundred thousand times, and the Warriors are the best team in basketball, so they're likely going to shape at least the next 10 years of basketball. If you're going to project just where the NBA is headed in the future, there's one direction you can guarantee that it won't go backwards. Let me know if you agree. Hey folks, I appreciate you watching and if you like this video, click the like button and be sure to subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter at, at @jkyleman. Say hey.